Hello, my name is Vladimir, and today I will talk about the work developed at FITSI Research uh, with collaboration uh, with Professor Ludwig Kripal that is called Teaching the Machine to Explain Itself Using Domain Knowledge. So using complex machine learning models um, to help the decision making becomes really standard in different uh, sensitive domains such as financial crimes, healthcare, or criminal justice, where a wrong decision can have really severe consequences. So it's really uh, crucial on those sensitive domains uh, to trust the model and understand its logic or what is happening inside the model and why the model is making such predictions. So the non-machine learning expert, uh, for instance, fraud analysts or uh, medics, uh, do not understand the model's predictions, uh, hindering the trust and efficiency. So if they don't understand, they don't believe the model and it can really hurt their efficiency in decision-making process. So the field of explainable AI uh, emerges to tackle these problems of um, interpretability in order to fill this gap of interpretability um, in complex machine learning models. However, the state-of-the-art methods in this explainable AI either produce low-level feature attribution explanations that are not suited to, for the non-machine learning experts, for instance, for the fraud analysts, because they can basically don't understand what the, those type of feature means, or uh, methods produce the concept-based explanations that could be useful for, um, for decision makers. However, those methods do not work with tabular data, uh, which is one of the main, um, main domain uh, in, the, in the machine learning field. So uh, one of the possible examples of uh, the, what could be the reasoning when some, some domain experts are reasoning about, uh, about something in, um, in fraud domain, for instance, fraud analyst, it can be something like there are multiple shipping addresses in the last hour, so it seems to shipping, it's fraud. So here we can see the two different patterns, for instance, multiple shipping addresses and reshipping, that basically when the fraud analysts are thinking about those two patterns, the fraud analysts conclude that some transaction or some event is fraudulent. So the ideal human interpretable explanation for domain uh, experts will provide some high level uh, insights about the model's predictions. So the main goals of this work is to develop a self-explanable neural network that will gently learn a predictive task, for instance, uh, fraud detection, and also associated domain knowledge explanations that in our use case, it can be, for instance, fraud uh, patterns, different fraud patterns. Also, we want to develop a taxonomy of fraud concepts that will be used as the explanations. So we want to develop a taxonomy and then use those concepts from the taxonomy uh, to enforce the explanation or provide different explanations. We also want to leverage the human in the loop feedback in order to continuously improving uh, not only the predictive accuracy of the model, but also its explainability. And finally, we want to create a semantic mapping between uh, the different concepts and um, already existed uh, rule-based system in order to uh, have a strategy to automatically label the concept-based uh, data sets. So our proposed solution uh, in the real world fraud detection system works uh, as following. So we have a new transaction that uh, arrives to the model and then model produces two different uh, things. The first one is the decision task. So in our use case, it's fraud detection. So it basically produces what is the score for, um, for the decision task and also associated fraud patterns that are the main concepts. In our use case, it can be something like suspicious items, high speed ordering, and another. And all those patterns also have this associated score. Then all of this information together with the information of the transaction is shown to the fraud analyst. And then the fraud analyst, which is the um, human expert, can actually give, provide the feedback about uh, different concepts and about the decision that the model make. So then we can recall or we can collect all this feedback in order to continuously improve the predictive power and also the explainability of this, um, of this model. Uh, but now let's talk about some background and uh, the related work. 
So um, the first thing that we uh, must think about when we are reasoning about the interpretability, we need to decide when we want to build the interpretability. So we can separate those in three different types of, of when to build interpretability. We can have uh, we can have the model free interpretability when we basically don't have any machine learning model and we are only looking to, for instance, analyzing the data. Then we have in-model interpretability when we are trying to impose uh, the interpretability in the model's architecture, or for instance, the transparent models can be also considered as in-model interpretability. Then we also have the post-hoc methods, for instance, LIME, that is one of the most known um, post-hoc um, explainable um, method that basically uh, treat the model as the black box and only look into the inputs and the outputs in order to produce uh, the explanations. So in our use case, we are um, not interested in the model free because we are actually want to explain the model and explain what is happening inside of the model. We don't want the post hoc because in the recent work, um, some of authors uh, show that um, post hoc methods can present some uh, issues related to the reliability and stability. Um, so we decided to um, deep dive in this in-model interpretability in order to ensure that we are actually explaining the model and we want to impose uh, the interpretability in the model's architecture. Then also we have the taxonomy of the explanation output. So we can separate the different types of outputs that the possible uh, explanation method could have. So for instance, we can have feature-based explanation that basically presents a feature and its contribution to the final decision score. We can also have the example-based that is basically presenting some contrafactual or contrastive or similar example um, to one that we are explaining. We also can have the model internals that basically trying to show some specific part of machine learning model, for instance, um, hidden states of the RNNs. And finally, we have the concept-based explain explainability when we try to explain the model, providing some kind of high, uh, high level inside or high level representation of, um, of what is happening inside of the model. So uh, in our use case, we will focus on the concept-based explainability because um, we believe that uh, human or uh, human decision, um, decision makers are more familiar with, with some high level representation of the, of the input uh, instead of, for instance, analyzing the feature base or example based. One of the most known um, work in, in the concept-based explanation or concept-based explainability is called ACE, uh, that basically stands for Automatic Concept-Based Explanation. Um, and basically it's a global and local method. Um, it's model specific and it basically um, provides the different concept-based explanations. Uh, and in this case, the explanations are represented by a group of different pixels or the segments of the pixels. So basically as the input, we have an image and then we apply some segmentation method. We apply the clustering and then by applying another method that is called uh, TCAF, we basically produce the different concepts and its score or the, its contribution to the final, uh, to the final score. Uh, the main drawbacks of this work is that it's really um, tied to the uh, image domain. So we cannot apply this in the tabular domain. Um, then uh, there is also uh, another work that is um, well known that is called self-explainable neural network. And self-explainable neural network basically use an autoencoders in order to produce some low level feature presentation. And then the concepts or the explanations are the prototypes. Uh, so in this case are the most representative examples of, um, of the input. Uh, however, sometimes uh, when we are presenting another example for the, for instance, uh, when fraud analysts, for instance, have really short time in order to make a decision, if we present another example, they need to analyze another example. So it can take more time to them to analyze this transaction or this event. Um, and also we don't have any control about the concepts that are uh, that this model are providing. So if, for instance, we want to use some domain knowledge uh, in order to produce some, um, some better concepts or something like that, it's not possible by using this method. So um, 
after reviewing all these uh, all these methods and another method that that um, are uh, presented in the related work or in the in the field of expandable AI, we didn't find any that could fit uh, all our requirements. So um, what we came up with a solution that is basically called JUEL, that stands for Jointly Learned Concept-Based Explanations. And basically it's a neural network uh, based framework to gently learn a decision task and also associated domain knowledge explanations. So JUEL is self-explainable model and by self-explainable, it basically incorporates the interpretability in its architecture. So we're trying to um, allow this model to produce the decision, but also the explanations that are related to its decisions. And also Joel provides a high level uh, insights about the model's prediction. Uh, so those, uh, because of those explanations are the high level insights, uh, those high level are really, are really similar to the domain experts on reasoning. So regarding the architecture, um, so firstly, uh, the Joel architecture is divided by three main, uh, three main components. Uh, we have the explainability layer and explainability task that basically the explainability layer is responsible to produce different concept-based explanations. And then all of those concept-based explanations are fed to the decision layer. And then the decision layer providing some decision in this case. Also, we have uh, uh, different parameters that are common for the two different tasks. So we're trying to jointly learn um, this explainability or the explainability task and decision task. So our loss function, the final loss function, will convey the information about the loss or all the gradients that are uh, uh, that are flowing for, uh, from the uh, decision loss and also from the explainability loss. Uh, so at the explainability layer, when we are trying to do the updates of the neural network weights, the information will be uh, will be updated regarding with explainability task and also the decision task. So there is another problem that uh, neural network require million of training examples to achieve good results, and uh, sometimes it's really difficult to manually or uh, it's even infeasible to manually label millions of examples. So in order to um, bypass this problem of label scarcity, uh, we used a distance, super, distance supervision approach that is based uh, on the triggered rules for each transaction, because we already have the access to the uh, legacy rule system uh, at, um, at FITSAI. So basically, distance supervision is a semi-supervised approach that is typically used when there is uh, insufficient data, uh, insufficient label data. So uh, regarding the implementation workflow, how all of this system works. So first we have the domain experts that define the concepts that will be used as the explanation. For instance, we have the fraud analyst that provide to us the information about different patterns or different uh, concepts that they are, they are usually um, dealing in, day, in their day, uh, daily life. So we have the taxonomy. Then uh, by having this mapping between different rules and different concepts taxonomy, we create uh, this mapping. So by providing the single label data set that contains different transaction, we apply this mapping that, or this mapping or this technique called distance supervision, we create a multi-label data set. Then we run a grid search in order to find the best model. We evaluate all of these model, models on the test set and select the best or uh, the, the best model um, depending on the metric that we define or evaluation metric that we define. Um, and finally, uh, we have the final step that is basically uh, when we uh, deploy the model in the real world application. So basically what we have here is the Joel model or the best selected model and the different uh, uh, domain expert that will interact with models. So Joel will provide the different decisions and explanations and the fraud analysis will provide the feedback. So basically by having all this uh, feedback loop, we are improving the decisions and the explainability of this, of this model. So regarding the experiments, uh, firstly, uh, we 
uh, together with the fraud analyst, we define the fraud taxonomy. And fraud taxonomy is basically composed by different concepts. In our use case, it was nine fraudulent concepts and one reserved that is called another fraud. So when some, uh, some domain expert don't know uh, what type of concept it is, we basically assign to other fraud. Also, we have the legitimate concepts to, uh, that are three. Uh, so we have nothing suspicious, for instance, or good customer history that basically symbolize when is uh, the transaction or uh, nothing is wrong in the, in the transaction. And we also have the, another, another logic that is basically saying that there is nothing uh, or if the, the fraud analyst don't know what kind of concept it is, he basically assigned to another logic. So regarding uh, to the, this, uh, this mapping or how we make this mapping. So um, one rule can be associated with one or more uh, concepts. So by having this rule concepts mapping, we can apply this mapping and create the noisy labels that will be a proxy to the true labels or true concepts uh, for each transaction because each, trans each transaction uh, have different triggered rules. So for instance, there is an example. For instance, we have the amount rule that basically says that when transaction amount is larger than some value, uh, we can associate this because this rule is, um, is related to the uh, amount and the money. So we can um, associate this uh, with suspicious items because when someone is spending money, it can be related with the items. Then we also have, for instance, the payment card ID was detected more than n times in less than k minutes. So in this case, we have two different things. We have the card that can be um, seen a suspicious payment. And also we have uh, a lot of different transaction in the short period of time. So we can assign this in the high speed ordering concept. So in total, we linked around uh, 3000 rules and the final training distance supervision set that was used uh, to train uh, contains basically uh, for uh, that four millions of concept based annotated uh, transactions. As the baseline, we consider a vanilla multi-label neural network. And by vanilla multi-label, we basically mean that all these, um, all these outputs are in the same level. Uh, so we don't have uh, the like uh, sequence or we have different losses. Here we have just uh, individual loss for each head. And unlike, again, unlike the Joel, the decision task is not influenced by concepts. So they, all of them are at the same level. And also for Joel architecture, we try different loss functions. Uh, we tried uh, uh, a normal uh, binary cross entropy and also BBML uh, L that is widely used in the multi-level problems. As the evaluation matrix for the decision task, we use recall at 3% of false positive rate. And it's basically a business constraint that we use in order to avoid the negative effect on the legitimate uh, users. And for the explainability task, uh, we use the mean uh, area under the rock curve uh, for different concepts because it's a, a threshold agnostic metric. And because we are not making a binary decisions, um, we are basically showing the concept and associated uh, score to this concept. So regarding the results, um, here we have the baseline and Joel with two different loss functions. And as we can see, uh, the Joel architecture um, basically uh, are better in the decision task. In this case, it's fraud recall and also on the explainability task that is measured on the uh, mean, um, mean, um, mean AOC. And also we can see that the Joel uh, with standard uh, binary cross entropy uh, loss function can offer a good trade-off between uh, those two. And uh, so basically in total, we trained uh, different models. And because of this hierarchical structure of Joel, the information from the decision task is affecting the, uh, the, the information from, uh, yeah. So the information from the decision and the explainability, uh, we are jointly learning all of this. And this is why, for instance, here, uh, because we are using the information uh, that flows from the decision task, the explainability of this model is also improving. So 
regarding the human teaching evaluation process, uh, firstly, we basically run a notation campaign when, with free uh, fraud analysts, where we collect around 1561 uh, manual label concept annotate transactions through the case management software that is usually used in the daily basis by the fraud analysts. Then we split uh, all this uh, transaction that we collected uh, in, in train validation and test. Then we choose the best hyperparameters on the training set. So we run a fine tuning of the original model. So we pick one model and then we run hyperparameter uh, on the training set in order to select the best one. And this uh, best uh, model is selected on the validation set based on the highest mean LC, so the highest on the expandability task. So finally, we have this model. We retrain the model by using this augmented data set with train and validation. And finally, we measure the performance on the uh, holdout human uh, label test set in order to see what is the real performance. And as the result, uh, we can see that, uh, so here we are comparing the um, LC without any tuning, so without teaching process. Then we have the teaching process when we have the model and then apply this human teaching process. And as we can see, overall, uh, we can have around 24% uh, percent of explainability task boosting. So by applying this teaching process, we can boost the explainability task by, uh, by around 24%. Uh, percent. And also, uh, we can see a huge improvement of on uh, some concepts that were really poor on, on the, the vanilla uh, model without any uh, human teaching. But also we can see here an example of some concepts that are actually worth string uh, when we are applying this human, uh, this human uh, feedback. And one of the possible reasons for that, for that is that we are using different uh, fraud analysts and different fraud, fraud analysts can have different perception of the concepts. So it can happen that their mental model is not aligned so the different, uh, so the same concept for instance, suspicious payment can be perceived differently by different uh, fraud analysts. And it's one of the problem and we will try to tackle this problem in the future work. So regarding the conclusion, uh, we will validate this uh, Joel model in the real world e-commerce fraud detection data set. And basically the obtained result shows the first that it's basically this model is able to uh, learn both, both the concept exp explanations and also the fraud decision task. So it's possible to train, jointly train this model that we learn the different high level insights or the fraud concepts and also the decision task. Uh, we have significant gains on predictive accuracy and explainability when we apply this uh, human feedback. And finally, we have the, this by proposing or by using this distance supervision approach, we can overcome the label scarcity problem uh, by applying this, uh, this approach. So if you have any question, uh, please reach us out. And thank you very much for uh, seeing this presentation.